Chuck mentioned it this morning, but when I was a kid, um, this was kind of like the, the death sentence on, on a sermon. This meant that you were going to spend the whole night squirming in your chairs, and you know, it was going to be very uncomfortable, and you were going to have nightmares that night. And then for the next couple mornings afterwards, you were going to check through the house and make sure you, know, you didn't miss the rapture or something. And, uh, you know, it really just, I feel like sometimes the, the church just kind of gets a little bit offhand on some things. And my purpose in, in tonight's lesson is to kind of help you to not be afraid. Because, I mean, I think some fear is just taught. A good, there, there's a good sense of fear, like, you know, where it encourages us to stop doing something that we know is wrong, right? That's a good kind of fear. But then there's mostly a bad kind of fear where we just kind of try and, and scare people into doing what we want them to do. Not necessarily the right thing, just what we want them to do, you know? And uh, that's kind of the environment that I grew up with with this. So we're going to talk about the end times, hell, heaven, and death. You're going to talk all about that in one thing, yes, and I'm going to not make it very long, okay? So uh, it was very common to be afraid of things, these things um, in the atmosphere that I grew up in. Um, and it was almost like we were taught to fear, you know, like Chuck mentioned this morning, revelations. No! <laughs> you know, it's just, I guess it's synonymous, revelations with fear. <laughs> so, uh, and I do want to encourage you, don't be over-fascinated with the doctrine of the end times, with the doctrine of hell or heaven and the doctrine of death. It's not good to be over-focused on any one doctrine, you know what I mean? It's good to have a good theology but when everything you talk about is always about the end times, when you're always you know, trying to scare people, it's like, okay, let's get a little more balance in there. Um, I mean, if you read through the prophets, for instance, a very small fraction of what the prophets prophesied hasn't happened yet. A very small fraction. Most of what they talked about has already happened. So, I mean, but for whatever reason, we'll, we'll avoid entire, pass entire sections of the Bible. Well, let's not go to the prophetic books, because there might be something about something scary in there. Let's not go to Revelations, because that's the one that scares people. Let's not, see what I mean? And I really think that, that God doesn't want us to live in that fear. Um, so we'll talk about the end times first. And one of the, one of the things that, that you don't really hear people talk about, especially when they go on, on, on these rants about the end times, the end times, we are already in the end times. Um, it happened at the moment of Jesus' resurrection. That was the that was when we entered the door to the end to the, to the, the end times. So we've been in the end times for two thousand years. Now you would know that from talking to a lot of these pastors that were preaching twenty years ago, where you know they turn to their favorite passages in, in Timothy, where it says, "In the last days, these people will rise up." Well, yeah, he Paul was talking about something that, that was happening in his current time and continues and will continue until the end of the, the age. In Acts 2, uh, really verses 1 through 21, I'm not going to read all that, but through that whole section there, uh, the Holy Spirit comes on the apostles, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and a lot of people say, oh, they're just drunk. And then Peter gets up and he says, look, we're not drunk. That, that's not what has happened at all. And I'll, re I'll start reading in verse 14. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, fellow Jews and all you res residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And he goes on quoting Joel there. But did you see what he said? In the last days. So what he's saying is, this thing that just happened is a sign that we're in the last days. See? So... Don't let people persuade you into fear that now all of a sudden, because there were blood moons last year or this year or whenever, that now we're in the end, the end times. We've been in the end times for 2,000 years, okay? Let's kind of get some more, you know, the, good theology in that. Next, um, did I, yeah. Next, don't let people scare you with astrology. Christian astrology has become a very big thing where we can predict when the end times will be based on stars or where the moon is or what the sun is doing. This is astrology, and God specifically told us in the Old Testament, do not partake of astrology. He didn't say astrologers wouldn't ever get any details right. He just said don't partake of it. Don't practice divination. But see, what some Christians have done is, is, is they practice divination. They say this is when the end comes, and we know that because of this star or because of the four blood moons. You saw John Hagee do this, uh, I think it was last year. 
you know, made this, he bit, made a lot of money scaring people, came up with a whole book on the blood moons. But did it happen? No, it didn't happen. Because the Bible doesn't say we can know when the end is by practicing astrology. In fact, it says the opposite. It says nobody knows the time. Don't worry about it. Not even the Son of Man knows, so, so don't worry about it. And then he goes a step further and says, don't practice astrology. So there's a kind of a big, a big difference there from what we hear and what, we, what is true. So astrology will not predict the end, but there will be signs when it is the end. Okay, so for instance, in Matthew 24, Matthew 24, verse 29, it says this, Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not shed its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. See, he doesn't say that these signs will come before the end. He says that at the end, these signs will happen. It's like, for instance, the star that was over Jesus. Was, did the star appear before Jesus' birth or after his birth? After his birth. And the people followed the stars to where he was. He was about two years old by the time that they found him, which is why Herod killed all the kids two years and younger. It would have been a little bit overkill if baby, was, if baby Jesus was only like a month old, don't you think? Wouldn't that be a little bit overkill? Wiping out an entire city of kids just to make sure that one little baby dies? I mean, that's a little overkill. But see, Herod didn't know which one of the two-year-olds he was. So he killed all the kids two years and under based on when the star appeared. See, the star appeared, I want you guys to get this, the star appeared in the heavens after Jesus was born. We aren't going to be able to date the end according to stars in the heavens. Don't let people move you to fear, okay? These, these are, and, and you see them do it every couple of years. My, my wedding anniversary, uh, May 21st, 2011, that was supposed to be the end. Uh, a couple of weeks ago was supposed to be the end. Uh, Y2K was supposed to be the end. The mad cow disease was supposed to be the end. So all these things that, you know, there's all these kinds of different prophets. And what did Jesus say? He said, people are going to tell you, here Jesus is coming out in the, in the desert. And when they say this, don't listen to them. Because it will be like a flash that you see all across, the, all across the sky. When I come, I come in power and everybody will know that I've come. It's not going to be something that you have to follow some false prophet that says I'm going to appear on this day at this time in this place. Because when I appear, it will be in power and you'll know. See, this is what happens when we don't stay in the word. Um... And then the next thing I want to say there, um, the end of the age will come suddenly and could happen at any time. So don't worry about it. Honestly, this is something that a lot of people just, they, they really become moved to such a state of fear that I honestly believe that it corrodes their spiritual development. I honestly believe that, that, that fear corrodes spiritual development. I really believe that with my whole heart. Really fully believe that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through 2 says this, About the times and the seasons, that is, of the end, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Don't worry about what all these people say. Oh, this is a sign of the end. 2012, that's the end. You know, don't listen to these people. They're false prophets. Anybody who tells you this is the time of the end is a false prophet. Anybody who tells you this is this certain hour, this certain day is a false prophet. And time will prove it. Time will prove it. The guy who prophesied a couple weeks ago that that Saturday was going to be the end of the world, he said, okay, okay, I was wrong. But by the end of October, the world will be unrecognizable. Do you know why he said that? Because he was trying to buy himself time. Because he lied to people. For the sake of earning money. He was nothing but a charlatan. So here we are in October, and I still recognize the world. It looks exactly like it did back when he prophesied. He was a false prophet. False prophets occasionally get some details right. God's prophets always get every single detail right. God's prophets have a 100% accuracy. If there's details that are wrong, it's not God's prophets. And God even told you, do not listen to these people when they say, oh, over here, here's the sign of the coming. Over here, it will come like a thief in the night. Don't let people move you to fear. Um, you can go to the next point there, buddy. Um, so God is still in control. There's kind of two things I want to say here. God is still in control. Remember that. No matter what happens with North Korea, no matter what happens with America, no matter what happens all these things, God is still in control. We don't have to be given to a spirit of fear. Okay? And then the second thing I want to say there, the Holy Spirit is our proof that we are not forgotten. St. Corinthians says it like this. If I can find St. Corinthians, it's even on big tabs. Maybe there is no hope for me, huh? 
2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 22 says this, He has also put his seal on us and given us the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, in our hearts as a down payment. See, the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, that's God's sign. That's our guarantee from God that he is working in us and that there is a greater glory coming. That's why the Holy Spirit was given to us, because God knew that it was going to be a little bit of time before he came back. So he gave us a stamp, a mark, a down payment. When you go to buy a house, you give a down payment. That's what the Holy Spirit is. God bought us, and until we are fully in salvation in heaven, okay, the Holy Spirit is our down payment from God. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So, um, that's all I really want to say about the, uh, about the end times. Let's move on now to hell. Now, hell is a very difficult concept because a lot of people have a, prob have a, have a problem with the fact that, that, that God's going to send people to a place that they're going to spend an eternity in punishment. That sounds you know, pretty harsh for a lot of people, and so it's hard for them to accept. But no matter what our problem with the theology of it is, we have to understand that our emotions don't dictate what is true and what isn't true. And God's word says that this is true. Now, I do want to say this, that if there was no such thing as punishment, then grace really wouldn't mean anything, would it? It wouldn't be that big of a deal that God showed grace to us, would it? Who cares? I'm just going to go on, and I'm not going to remember anything. I'm not going to be in a place of punishment. What incentive is there for me to do what's right? Right? Adolf Hitler, eh, it's fine. He didn't go to hell. He just ceased to exist. And child, mol and child, rape, uh, mol and child molesters, it's fine. It's fine. God's not going to punish them. How can you honestly th say that that's a just thing? That somebody who, who molests and rapes children doesn't get any kind of a punishment. It doesn't really sound like a very just God, does it? See, I mean, so although people try to dismiss hell because that doesn't sound like a fair thing, dismissing hell makes it even more unfair. Because people like Adolf Hitler, who were responsible for so many people dying, they just pretty much get a get out jail free card. I know a lot of people who are rebellious to God in their hearts, and they don't want there to be a heaven or a hell. They just want to cease to exist. That's what they want. But remember, we were created for our own glory. We were created for God's glory, and uh, that's just that's just something that's hard for us to get. But it is still truth. So in Matthew twenty five forty one. So the first thing here, uh, hell is a place that God originally made for the rebellious angels. You know these as demons. God made angels, and some of them rebelled, led by um, who we know, now know as Lucifer, Satan, the devil. And so God created hell as a place for these to go to. However, when we rebel against God, we go to a place he didn't intend for us to go to. Hell. Because we reject God. Now Matthew 25, 41 says this, um, Then he will also say to these on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, and into the... Uh, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See, he didn't say in the eternal fire that, that I planned for you before your creation. He says what I intended for the devil and his angels. So, it's kind of a really big point there. Um, also, we have kind of some misunderstandings about hell. Uh, the first one there is, demons are not torturing others, but are themselves tortured. You know, we have a lot of images of, of Satan and the devils. They're just kind of sitting down there in hell with these whips, and they're just like, you know, whipping all the people who did bad or whatever, you know. But that's not hell, okay? Because the demons aren't having a good time there either. <laughs> okay, in fact, the, the demons that were in the one guy who called himself Legion, um, in fact, he begged for God not to send him. <laughs> because, you see what I mean? I don't think it was a place of joy for him. Um, so there on there, you see Satan's not hanging out down there torturing people. It's not like, yes, I gotta go back down there. And, you know, and, and if you watch common you know, uh, Hollywood stuff, I mean, even on, on shows like Futurama, you know, the, the robot devil is down there and he's, you know, doing his thing, and it's like, that's not really hell, though. Um, also, it's not reachable from our physical world, okay? It's not reachable from the realm. You can dig down into the earth, you can fly through the sky, you're never going to be able to reach hell. It's, it's like heaven, it's unreachable in our dimension, okay? Um, is also in a different dimension from heaven as well. It's not in the same dimension as heaven. Okay, so that one means there's multiple dimensions which a lot of scientists have theorized anyways, and that's just exactly what the Bible says too, and I'll show you proof from the scriptures. So there's this difference between heaven and hell and earth, and you can't reach each one from each place. Does that make sense? It's like there's a door that you can't open. Um, 
And to show you, kind of, to help you understand what I'm saying here, I'll go to Luke chapter 16. And this really shows, um, really shows what I'm trying to say. Luke chapter 16, starting verse 25 and going through 26. And it's, Jesus is telling this story about um, a rich man and his, basically, a, 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 you could just say homeless person, it's fine, named Lazarus. And um, the rich man, you know, doesn't really have any pity on Lazarus. He just lives his life for himself. And then when he dies, he goes to hell, and Lazarus ends up, ends up in heaven. And this is what it says. Um, he cries out to Abraham in heaven, and he says, please, please, you know, help me. Let me go back or something. Let me go back and warn other people or, or, or let, let something happen to relieve me here. And, he, and Abraham says this. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things, just as Lazarus received the bad things. But now he is comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. Neither can those from there cross over to us. See, there's heaven and hell exist in two different dimensions, just as earth exists in different dimensions. See, some people think, oh, well, we've disproven God because we've sent shuttles out into, into space and we haven't found heaven. That disproves God. No, God is invisible, first off. Second off, God exists, heaven exists in another realm from earth. You're not going to be able to reach it with the shuttle. So, I mean, it's not, it's not like that. Okay? So, a few things there. Can't reach from this world, separate dimension from heaven. I have said that. Um, it is also eternal punishment for those who do not accept Jesus. In 2 Peter, chapter 2, it says this, uh, starting in verse um, 4 through 10. It says this, For if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment, and if he didn't spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, when he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly, and if he reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is coming to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the depraved behavior of the moral, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, his righteous soul was tormented by the lawless deeds he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from trials and, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who follow the polluting desires of the flesh and despise authority. So now let's move on to heaven. Boy, heaven to me was honestly just as scary as hell was growing up. You know, yeah, oh my gosh, just the, the level of, of intense fear I had about heaven. You know, and, and I think, some of that I think is natural, and some of that I think is kind of taught. Uh, so I, my hope is to kind of get past all of that. The first thing I want to say is, did you know that in heaven we don't have mansions? <laughs> did you know that? There's, there's I mean, even, even hymnals about this, you know, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, you know, all this stuff. But the Bible actually never says that we get a mansion. <laughs> and I think that's important because obviously a materialistic society would believe that we each get our mansion because we're really materialistic, right? If I don't have all my junk with me, it's not worth having, right? You, you think about it with the, the Egyptian pharaohs, when they got buried, they got all their crap thrown in there too. And you know, hey, throw in the wives too, just in case, you know. You never know. You know, all these things about accumulating for ourselves, you know, something in the next life. And, then, and so then, of course, we make it out to be as though the Bible says this. This is actually a mistranslation that is only in one translation of the Bible, the King James Version, um, as far as I know. I mean, I haven't seen any of the other ones. And the word is actually better translated as um, dwelling place or uh, spot. Okay. Uh, so in, in the CSB, which is what I'm reading out of right now, let's read the spot. Um, there in chapter 14 of John. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Verse 2. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. See, he never said mansions. In the King James, it says, in my Father's house, or something like that, are many mansions. I forget exactly how, how it says that. Which doesn't really even make sense because what he's trying to talk about it is the sense of togetherness. If there's many rooms. There's room enough for you too. Why would a mansion where you would be separated from other people, where they'd be separated from you in their own mansions, how does that get that give unity? <laughs> See what I mean? Like that completely goes against what Jesus is trying to say here. <laughs> so let's kind of keep things in perspective there. 
Um, uh, second off, we don't become angels. This is something that's so often taught. Um, oftentimes it has to do with when children die. A lot of people, for some reason, believe that when children die, they become angels in heaven. Um, not, just, not just children, obviously. Some people teach this with um, you know, people that they really cared about. And you have to understand that when people say stuff like this, it's because they hurt and they want to believe something good. But I want you to remember something. We are made higher than the angels in the resurrected body. 1 Corinthians 6.3 even says this. Don't you know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? We are going to judge angels. Do you really want your dead child to come back as, a, as someone who you are later going to have to go and judge? That doesn't sound like a good thing, does it? Not only that, but angels are just messengers. Not only that, but angels cannot receive salvation. If they mess up, if they rebel against God, that's it. Only people can, can be saved. Only people. So are you sure you want your child to become an angel in heaven? <laughs> now, with that being said, there is nothing in the Bible, don't worry, your child's not going to lose their salvation later in the future. Um, there is nothing in the Bible that even remotely says that, that our kids become angels. That's complete, complete made up, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, thank God, because we're going to be made higher than the angels. See, what the Bible says is we're a little bit lower than the angels right now until we're given the resurrected body then we'll be higher than the angels, which is good. Um, we don't sit around on, on, on playing harps on clouds. This is complete myth. I mean, there's nothing even in the Bible to support this. There's one spot that I can kind of see where you could take it, okay? In Revelations, it mentions the 24 elders um, in heaven, and it says that they each had a lyre, which is like a harp. I, oh, I guess you can kind of apply that to, hey, now we're all going to have angels, I mean, wings and, and harps and... I guess, but it's kind of a leap there, <laughs> and uh, so it doesn't it doesn't say that at all. Um, so we don't sit around playing harps, and we do still experience things. Sometimes I thought it, it, a lot of people think that heaven's going to be this really boring place, you know, where nothing ever happens. We don't ever experience anything. We just kind of sit there all day, and in a monotone voice, we say, "Yes, Jesus." Yes, Jesus. But the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Adam and Eve, before they fell from the garden, did they have stuff to do? Yes. What did Jesus say? My father had work to do before I ever came, and I continue in that work while I'm on earth, and I will continue in that work. That's what Jesus said, which means that there will always be something for us to do. We're not going to be bored in heaven. See, it's a common myth that today, since, you know, righteousness is boring and, and the world is real fun, that means that heaven's going to be boring and, well... That's not, that's not how it is at all. Um, let's see. So we will experience things. We do, will still experience emotions like joy and comfort. God himself experiences emotions. There's no reason to assume that in our resurrected body we will cease to be even... That would mean that we'd be less than what Adam and Eve were before the fall. So I mean, that's not a place of hope. That's a place of I'm going to become a robot in the future and... I guess God just made me to be a robot. God didn't make, make us to be robots. In fact, Ephesians and, and Corinthians, they said the exact opposite. There is beauty in that diversity that God has made us. You know, the church is black and white, male and female, master, master and, and slave. It's all of them. We're all one body in Christ. God has made us to be diverse. We're all a little bit different. Not all of us would do the same thing that someone else does. Why? Because we're not the same person. So, I mean, and God made us to be like that. If he wanted us to all be the same, he would have made us all the same. But he didn't. So there is that. Um, also remember that God himself experiences emotions, which would mean that if God was going to take away our emotions, the very creativity that he gave us in the first place, he'd also have to change himself. But we know that God is perfect and never changes. So we know that we will still experience things in heaven. Um, a few other things. Uh, we will still be doing things, and we will not be all-knowing. Sometimes we get it where when we get to heaven, we're going to be like a God. We're not going to be like a God. We will not be all-knowing. In fact, even the angels in heaven are not all-knowing. They, they desire the mysteries, the mysteries of God. And things are revealed, but not all things. And so when we get to heaven, it does talk about this too, the fact that we will not know everything in heaven. Okay, So you don't have to worry about that either. Great news, right? Also, here's another idea. Um, there is no chance when you, once you get to heaven that, that you will somehow sin and lose your salvation. I don't know how, 
but somehow we're going to be given, in our exalted body, we're going to be where we cannot sin. I don't know exactly how that works, but that's what the Bible says, and so that's what I'm going to believe. I, I don't know exactly how it works. If you want to know how it works, die, and uh, then you'll know. Uh, give us a call. Give me a call. Let me know. Um, it's not impersonal hallways. Sometimes we think of as heaven as this really scary place, which really we're, we're, we're real scary. We just think of real tall hallways and, and just corridors that go on and on forever, just big empty rooms. Or we think of a big room with the television where we all get to watch past reruns of our lives and stuff. And these kinds of things aren't biblical, okay? <laughs> They're just not. Okay, that's just not how it goes. Um, the Bible clearly says that our sins will be cast as far as the east is from the west. And so we know that when the judgment comes, he's going to look at us and say, covered by the blood of the Lamb. That's it. There's not going to be a screen that plays with all your mistakes. It's not going to be a screen that plays where everybody sees how you messed up time and time again. It's not going to happen. Your name and your presence in heaven will be solely dependent on whether your name was in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's it. There's no stress, no what-ifs. We can know of our salvation, and the Holy Spirit is our stamp mark. The Holy Spirit is a sign to us that God is doing something. When we have the gifts of the Spirit in the church, that's a sign to us that God is doing something. When God changes us over the course of the time, and our, and our thinking starts changing, that's a sign that the Holy Spirit is given to us. So, um, God's presence is there all the time. There's not, a, there's not a distinction there as, as there is here. Um, there will not be problems. And, and there's a little bit of controversy whether we'll be able to remember our life here or not. Um, I don't see anything in the Bible that says that we won't remember. But it also says that there'll be no grief, no sorrow, no pain. So I'm not quite sure how that works. Because I don't know about you, but some painful things have happened on this earth. I don't know how you could be happy remembering all the nonsense that happened here on earth. I don't know. But the Bible never says that we're going to get our mind wiped. <laughs> it never says that, okay? So I, I, there's some things the Bible just doesn't answer, and we have to be okay with that. We just have to rest in the truth of what the Bible does say. Whatever, whether we do remember or don't remember, God will be there to comfort us, and there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. That sounds like a plan to me. Um, God will always be there to comfort us. I, I, I wanted to try and give some imagery here. Have you ever gone to a really relaxing place? Maybe somewhere with a waterfall, or, oh my gosh, the beach. I love the beach. The, the steady cascading of the waves. You know, wherever your happy place is, I don't care. And uh, this how peaceful it is there, right? Sometimes you can almost forget all the crap that's going on. Now it times that by about a billion, kajillion, forever, infinity, and that's happened all the time. There's never a moment where that feeling goes away. You don't suddenly lose heart when you hear your phone ring, like, oh no, what the hell? It's not like that in heaven, okay? So, you know, once again, there's, we're not going to be able to fully understand these things until we get there, so don't worry too much about it, okay? Um, we, will, we will be changed, and it says, in the twinkling of an eye. That's pretty darn fast. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's really fast. It's not like we're just going to be waiting around and just like, oh, there goes my arm, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, it's like waiting to go to sleep. Okay, the rapture and death, it's like waiting to go to sleep. Can you honestly discern the moment that you fall asleep? No. You start getting tired, you, you slowly start kind of zoning out, and then all, before you know it, it's the next morning, right? If you've ever gotten a surgery and they give you the anesthesia, you know, they're just, okay, count back from 10. And then you wake up and you're like, uh, 10. <laughs> you know, is there any, like, it, it, death and, and the rapture, it's like that. It's going to happen so quick, you're not going to have time to worry about it. So why worry about it? Why spend so much of your life worrying about something that honestly is going to be so fast? It's like, you know what I mean? It's like when, when, when you're a kid and you're afraid of getting that shot. And you go in and they're like, okay, I want, I, want you to, I want you to just breathe, okay? And they're like, okay, done. And you're like, wait, you, you, you're done? You gave me the shot already? And they're like, yeah, it's over. It's like, oh, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. I'll get the flu shot next year too, you know? It's things that is not that stressful. We stress out about it because we're on this side of eternity. Um, um, it's okay. I already said that. Uh, the reason why I think that we're so scared uh, of death and that kind of stuff is because we haven't done it yet. 
It's a new experience. We don't know what to expect. There's no test driving it. There's no way of, of, of asking somebody else, well, was it bad? At least like with shots and stuff like that, you can ask somebody else, like, did it hurt? The tetanus shot, did it hurt? You know, and you're not, we, don't, we don't have that ability to ask somebody, so I think part of that scares is just the fear of the unknown. What people don't know and what people don't understand, they fear, you know? And, and, and so I, I think that some of that's just a natural fear of just the unknown. Um, you, you know how you get around the new year, it's like a new chance, you're so excited, this year will be different. That's what heaven is like. When you get there, it's actually going to be different. It's like January 1st of the next year, but that hope never goes away because it's realized. So I hope that this is kind of giving you hope about something that the church oftentimes just brings despair about. Um, okay. Uh, and also, don't forget that God will give us the strength when it's time to go, which kind of takes us to our next point. You can go to our next point there, buddy. Uh, God will give us the strength when it's time to go. Don't worry and fear about tomorrow's trials. Jesus said it like this. Today has enough trials and, and tests of itself. You have enough stuff to worry about now. So just let tomorrow worry about itself. Let, let me put it like this. Are you dying right now? Are you on your deathbed? No? Don't worry about it. Are you right now? Is the rapture about to happen and you don't know if you're... Then, then don't worry about it. See what I mean? Why worry about something that you can't change. I once heard Will Smith giving a pep talk to people, and his point was actually very good. He said, when you go skydiving, you're scared. And you, you just die, you're like, oh man, I don't want to do this. But then your friends talk to you into it, so you do it, and you're on the plane, you're like, okay, I don't want to do this, just take me back to the ground. You know, and, and you're in this moment of intense fear, and then you jump out the plane and all the fear is gone. Because you, you feared what hadn't happened yet. But then once you're there, the feeling of excitement and just joy outweighs the fear that you felt back then. Now, I'm not going to jump off a plane. I think that's insane. <laughs> no way. I'm not even going to get in a plane if I can help it. Be like, yeah, uh, hey, let, let's say, for instance, I, I was a big mu musician or whatever, and they're like, hey, can you play some shows in Asia? I'd be like, is there a boat that goes? <laughs> or can I get to Asia by car? <laughs> or a horse? I'll take a horse. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really want to do the planes, but, you know, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so God will give us strength for, the, for what will come, okay? Don't forget that, you know, God, God right now is working in you. He's calling you to, to ministry. He's calling you to things, so don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry, worry about when the rapture will happen. Don't worry about when your death will be. Just don't worry about that stuff. It's not worth your time. You're going to waste so much of your living time. Worrying about your death, which only takes a second, <laughs> that you <laughs> you're gonna waste your whole life being afraid of something that you can't change. It's not like our you know our taxes, where if we file our taxes differently, we end up paying a different amount. We're all gonna die. I mean, what's the point of worrying about it? And Jesus said it like this: Can you, by worrying, add a single moment to your life? Elsewhere, it says, Can when you worry, can you even change your hair from black to white? Can you can you do that? Can you stop the aging process? No, you can't. It happens, and you just have to be okay with that. Um, we have to trust that God will lead us when it's our time. See, right now you're not ready for death because it's not your time yet. It's not your time to die. See what I mean? When it is your time, God will give you grace, and he will lead you through it. But imagine this. What if you leave tonight and die in a car accident, and you had never even had time to worry about it? What if you don't die of cancer, and you die real quick and painless? What if you die in your sleep? Then there was really nothing to worry about because you went to you died while you were relaxed. See what I mean? Like we just worry about stuff. Uh, death is assured, but we don't have to be afraid. Hebrews nine twenty seven says it's appointed for man to die. You're not going to accidentally die at the wrong time. You're going to die when God appoints you to die. Don't worry about it. When it's the right time, God will take you and you'll go to a better place. Obviously, I'm speaking to Christians. If you're not a Christian, I would highly encourage you to repent and turn to God because definitely don't want to be going to hell. Not a fun place. Uh, when we believe in Jesus, we have nothing to worry about. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all comfort. That's just how it is. We can trust in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is here to comfort us. Did I hit all those things? Yeah. We don't have to give ourselves fear. God will guide us at the right time. Yeah, I think I hit all that stuff. Um, so in conclusion here, I just want to say a few things. Um, if you could just pop up the whole conclusion slide there, buddy. Don't be given to a spirit of fear. God doesn't want you to live in a place of, of fear. Okay. Second, 
Don't let your worry roll. Don't let your worry roll. When worry comes, focus your mind on the things that is in God's word, not the things that aren't in God's word. Okay? Third, deal with today. Don't live in the future. Plan for the future. Absolutely. Plan like you will never die. But live like this is your last day. Just live in the now. Okay? Why waste your time worrying about something that might, may or may not even happen? James says like this. Why do you say with such confidence, we're going to go do this or we're going to go do that? Instead, you should say, if God wills, we're going to do that. But you can't know what the next day will bring. Why be so overconfident in the future? Um, and then next there, uh, trust God now. Just focus on trusting God now with your life and let tomorrow be tomorrow. Okay? Honestly, when you're in heaven, you're going to look back at the fear and worry that you had in this life, and you're going to say, why did I waste so much of my time, so much of my sleep at night, worrying about something that I couldn't even change? Why did I waste my life with that nonsense? You know, honestly, don't let your heart fear. Um, it'll happen when it happens. It'll happen when it happens. That's just the way it goes. So we're going to pray for two things. Uh, we're going to pray for non saved and we're going to pray for saved. So if you'll bow your head and join me, please. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who hasn't accepted you in their lives, I pray that you would um, that you would just draw near to them, Lord, and help them to accept you. I pray that um, that you would show them their need for you. And if you are here and you would like to accept uh, Jesus, it's really simple, really simple. Believe in Jesus, that he did in fact die for you, and he's the only way to salvation. Stop sinning. And when you do sin, confess them to God and trust that He's going that His sacrifice, His death on the cross, was good enough. It's that simple. Lord, I, I pray that you'd help them to see that they don't have to be in a place. They don't have to have a certain person with them because you are their mediator. You are the are the judge that they go to. You are the good good father that they can turn to and be saved at any time in any place. And uh, help them to trust in you, Lord. And I pray for those who are saved here uh, tonight. I pray that you would help them. To continue um, to stay in the Word and to study the Word, to continue in prayer, to, to continue to get involved with your kingdom and your works rather than paying so much attention to the material life and the physical world and, or being staying up at night worrying about stuff, but they just get involved and, and get uh, connected with your church. Um, and I also pray that you help us to stop sinning, Lord. We all have things that we struggle with, Lord, but just help us to overcome some of those things, Lord. Help us to start moving forward spiritually, Lord. Help us to draw closer to you. I help us to know you in a more personal way, Lord. Um, I pray that you'd help us as 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 Christians to not stag to not stagnate, but but become more and more mature, and uh, that we'd be a better and better example to others. That we'd be growing in the knowledge of you, Lord, and you'd bring us your comfort, and help us to to just know you in such a deep and real way. We thank you. Amen.